Evolutionists often argue that when two species share features in common, it is evidence for evolution. The logic is that if two species have similarities, it indicates that they must have had a common ancestor. This argument comes in many forms, from anatomical similarities to biochemical or genetic similarities. The problem with these arguments is that having similarities between two organisms does not necessarily indicate that they have a common ancestor. Scientists on all sides of the creation versus evolution debate actually agree. Dogs and wolves share a lot of features in common because they share a common ancestor. However, does this logic necessarily extend to all life on Earth? Let's take a look at a few examples and find out. Dolphins, ichthyosaurs, and fish all have streamlined bodies that are incredibly well adapted to an aquatic environment. Whether these adaptations are due to natural causes or whether they are design adaptations is the question. According to evolutionists, these streamlined bodies with a similar overall shape are not the result of common descent. Instead, they are a result of something called convergent evolution. In other words, mutation and natural selection has molded each of these three groups independently so that they evolved this way independent of the other groups. This is kind of like two car companies developing somewhat similar car designs independently. The only problem with this analogy, however, is that evolution is a blind process with no intelligent guidance, by definition. Now let's move on to marsupials and placentals. Marsupials and placentals are two groups of animals that evolutionary biologists believe to be only very distantly related. Interestingly, both groups have very similar counterparts to the other. There are placental flying squirrels and marsupial flying squirrels. There are also placental anteaters and marsupial anteaters. The most famous example, however, is the marsupial wolf, also known as the Tasmanian tiger, which shares an incredible number of similarities with the gray wolf. Yet interestingly, the mainstream evolutionary view is that the gray wolf is actually more closely related to humans than to the Tasmanian tiger. Again, these two very similar species are supposed to have evolved this way independently. Yet we still see striking similarities between the skull designs of these two very distantly related species. We often see textbook pictures that show the four limbs of several different vertebrate animals. The textbooks then go on to argue that this similarity of design is strong evidence that these four limbs were the result of a common ancestor. What textbooks don't tell you is that salamanders also have very similar forelimbs to other vertebrates. Yet the embryology of salamander forelimbs is so different from that of other vertebrates that some biologists now argue that the similarity is due to convergence. In other words, the forelimbs are very similar, but this is not similarity that is due to common ancestry. It has been pointed out that an octopus and a mouse actually have very similar design to their eye. Yet no one believes that they have a common ancestor with an eye like that. I first learned of this in an interview with an embryologist named Jonathan Wells, who is also a critic of Darwin. So how do scientists who are creationists explain all of this? Well, it will be surprising to some that creationists actually do invoke common ancestry at times to explain similarities, including similarities between two different species. Dogs and wolves are the example that I gave earlier. Also, convergence is something that we do see in nature, although as a creationist, I would object to calling it convergent evolution. For example, animals that have been trapped in caves often lose their eyes and their pigmentation. This is because natural selection, which creationists accept as a real process, often favors animals with no eyes and no pigmentation in certain environments. See my video on blind cavefish for more details. Often evolutionists will point out examples like this and equate this loss of genetic information with the idea that all life on Earth emerged naturally from a single common ancestor by saying that both are evolution, performing a bait and switch on the public and on biology students. Basically, evolutionary textbooks will say that evolution simply means that species change over time, and then they will equivocate the fact that species change over time with the belief that all life on Earth developed from one simple common ancestor that lived billions of years ago, with no outside intelligence guiding the process. Evolutionary textbooks will also mislead students by claiming that creationists deny that species change over time. 
This is a point of confusion for many people, so let me reiterate. Many textbooks will define evolution as change over time. However, evolution does not simply mean that species change over time. Creationists and evolutionists have always accepted that species change. That is not the issue, and that is not all that evolution entails. Evolution also claims that all species on Earth share one single common ancestor, and that this ancestor gave rise to all of the life that we see today, without the help of any sort of outside intelligence. To say that a fish losing its eyes in a cave proves that all life on Earth could have developed from one single common ancestor by gradually gaining new genetic information is logically fallacious. Yet this is a routine mistake that evolutionists make when they give so-called examples of evolution happening in nature or in the laboratory. We have now addressed two reasons for why different species will share some features in common. We talked about common ancestry and we talked about convergence. Both of these concepts are accepted by scientists who are creationists and scientists who are evolutionists. However, scientists in these groups disagree on how far common ancestry and convergence can be taken. Creationists, however, have a third explanation as to why species share certain features in common. That explanation is a common designer. Just as human designers will invoke many similarities in their inventions, such as the common language in different computer systems designed by Microsoft, or similar motors in vehicles designed by GM, scientists who accept a creationist approach view many similarities as being the result of a common engineer who programmed the DNA of those first few organisms. Often evolutionists will try to use examples of two species coming from one as evidence that all species share a single common ancestor. They will then accuse creationists of believing that all species were created independently. For example, the textbook entitled Evolutionary Analysis by Freeman, 4th edition, claims that creationists believe that all species were created independently and that species do not change. This, however, is not what creation scientists believe at all. Scientists working from a creation model view life on Earth not as a lawn or as a single massive tree, but as an orchard of creatures that God designed with initial variety. Often the trees in this orchard will branch, either due to a loss of initial variety in two different groups, or they will branch due to mutation. For example, all of the species of Galapagos finches likely share a single common ancestor with many, if not all of the species of finches that we see around the world today. This common ancestor would likely have been a single pair of finches on Noah's Ark. This is not the same as evolution, however, because there is no evidence that these slight differences in beak size explains where a beak came from in the first place. Just like there is no evidence that a species of fish going blind in a cave proves that fish could have gradually gained new genetic information to gradually develop into humans over the course of millions of years. In this video, I have discussed the views of both creation scientists and evolutionary scientists. But there is a third view that I did not mention. If the tree of life were real, it would not prove that it was the result of neo-Darwinism, and it would not prove that it formed naturally. Michael Behe, a biochemist and a proponent of a new theory called intelligent design, has put forth an interesting possibility on the matter. Michael Behe has argued that the tree of life is real, and that all of life on Earth descended from one universal common ancestor. Behe, however, does not agree with the notion that Darwinian processes alone are sufficient to explain the diversity of life that we see today. Instead, Behe argues that an outside intelligence is the best explanation for many of the features of the biological world that we see today. As a creationist, I disagree with Behe's view. However, he makes a good point. Even if there were a universal common ancestor, it would not prove that Darwinian processes were sufficient to account for all of the diversity of life that we see today. In conclusion, does all of this disprove evolution? No, of course not. However, it does show that similar features are not necessarily the result of common ancestry, and do not necessarily prove evolution. Similarity between two species can be the result of common ancestry, it can also be the result of convergence, and thirdly, it can be the result of a common designer, whom scientists working from a creationist perspective view openly as being the god of the Bible. 
Thanks for watching my video. Please feel free to subscribe, comment, and rate. And don't forget to check out my website, greenslug.com. And remember, slug is spelled with two G's.